The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. Good evening and welcome back to the Poe Museum. Before I begin, I'd like to remind you that you could have seen this episode before anyone else by supporting the Poe Museum on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Poe Museum. So without further ado, let's begin our second installment devoted to The Mask of the Red Death. This 1999 painting by Michael DeMarco from the Poe Museum's collection depicts a pivotal moment in The Mask of the Red Death in which the Red Death himself crashes the party. This is just one of many artworks in the museum's collection inspired by Poe's classic terror tale. And it's as good a place as any to continue our exploration of the Mask of the Red Death. And darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Those are the closing lines of Poe's classic horror story, The Mask of the Red Death, which has gone on to become a perennial favorite, including several movie versions like the 1960s version with Vincent Price, all the way down to the late 80s version with Sylvester Stallone's brother Frank Stallone in a modern castle in which a late 80s hair metal band is playing the rocking soundtrack throughout. It's also inspired numerous visual artists, including the legendary Bernie Wrightson, and more recently, the Spanish artist, David Fores, for his book, Ravings of Love and Madness. So it's definitely an inspirational, influential tale. But now I'm gonna take you back to where it all began. In searching for the origins of the Mask of the Red Death, we started at the source, the 1842 first printing of the story from Graham's Magazine, as well as some of Poe's previous plague stories, King Pest and Shadow from the Southern Literary Messenger. We follow this up by looking at the newspapers at the time to identify possible inspirations. And one of them that came right to the top was the 1832 cholera pandemic. But this wasn't the only contender for the possible plague that could have inspired Poe's story. So for another contender, let's take a look right here, in this Poe family Bible. It's a great resource because it shows us a lot of the family genealogy, but also the deaths. So very often we get to see the ages of people they died. Look, several people here died when they're not even a year old. And right here, died yesterday at two o'clock p.m. of yellow fever, George William Poe, eldest son of George Poe, senior. Yeah, yellow fever was another very common killer in Poe's day. Spread through mosquitoes, it was especially prevalent during the summer months. And then mysteriously as it came, it would disappear. Now we know that, well, the mosquitoes were going away in the winter, but back then they weren't quite sure what caused it. But several cities along the East Coast experienced cholera and yellow fever throughout the summer and Poe's mother was a famous actress in her day. She toured up and down the East Coast, very often trying to stay just one step ahead of the next yellow fever outbreak. And it didn't always work. She's performing in the major coastal cities. She's performing in the places where she's most susceptible to it. So first, she lost her mother to yellow fever down in South Carolina. 
Then she lost her stepfather to yellow fever in North Carolina. Then she got married and her husband died of yellow fever in Virginia. You just couldn't escape it. And then when she was just 24 years old, Poe's mother died of not yellow fever, but tuberculosis, which is a very widespread killer in Poe's day. It was spread through the air. Very often it affects people's lungs, what you call pulmonary tuberculosis. People would waste away, they'd cough up blood. And it was considered a very romantic, gentle way to die. In fact, in Poe's early story, Metzingerstein, he writes, the beautiful Lady Mary, how could she die? And of consumption, but it was a path I have prayed to follow. I would wish all I love to perish of that gentle disease. How glorious to depart in the heyday of the young blood, the heart all passion, the imagination all fired amid the remembrances of happier days in the fall of the year and so buried up forever in the gorgeous autumn leaves. So it was considered a poetic, gentle way to die. In fact, women who were suffering from tuberculosis or consumption would go very pale. They called it an unearthly glow. Their cheeks would get very rosy. And they thought that was a great look for them. But then, a few years later, in 1842, about late January 1842, Poe was doing pretty well for himself. He was starting to make some money off his writings. He was starting to have a few big hits. The Murders in the Rue Morgue was the first detective story. That was starting to get Poe's name noticed. So in a brief moment of tranquility, Poe was sitting at home with his wife and mother-in-law. His wife, Virginia, was playing the piano, singing a song, when she began to cough up blood. And they knew that was a death sentence. That meant that she had contracted the consumption. He wrote that his life really fell apart at that moment. He knew there was no real cure. They weren't sure exactly what was causing it, where it was from, coming from. They didn't know about germ theory yet. But red was really the sign of the consumption. Just like yellow fever, the yellow skin from people who are suffering from it in the late stages of cholera, the late stages of yellow fever would get yellow skin. And with cholera, your skin might turn a bluish gray as you were dehydrated from so much diarrhea. But with consumption, that red, that was the color of blood that was its avatar and its seal. In fact, very often you'd see women carrying handkerchiefs with red roses or strawberries or apples painted on them. And that was to camouflage the little specks of blood from them coughing into their handkerchiefs. So Poe knew this plague was coming. He'd already lost his mother, his brother, his foster mother to tuberculosis and he watched it claim his wife right before his very eyes and just a few months later in May of 1842 he published The Mask of the Red Death so it's tempting to think there's some autobiographical reference there maybe his wife's illness did play a part but certainly all the different plagues and pandemics he'd survived throughout his life did as well. And when we read this story, we'll see a lot of symbolism. There's seven rooms, each of a different color, and people have speculated that maybe these stand for the seven ages of man, the seven deadly sins, the seven days of the week. But also seven is sort of a magical symbol for completeness so what is the story trying to tell us? Well, those closing lines tell us what's maybe the best moral lesson we can get from it, that you really can't escape the plague. You can shut yourself up, you can hide out, you could run away to the country, 
But darkness, decay, and the red death are still going to get you. Well, thanks for joining us again. And if time permits, and the red death doesn't catch up with us, I look forward to seeing you on the next installment of The Curator's Crypt.